right, guys, welcome to this episode of the Garage Gym Podcast. Today, we've got on with Guy Gravett. So, Guy, can you just give everyone listening just a little bit about you and what your involvement in the sport has been? I got started in the sport, uh, well, kind of introduced to the sport fairly early. My father started at the age of 31, so that would have been 1968. And uh, so I was exposed to the sport early, but really didn't get started until uh, near the end of the age of 12 and then started to compete at the age of 13. So, uh, you know, competed uh, a number of times over those years, like uh, just over 150 competitions. And, uh, so, yeah. uh, you know, as a as a young junior, I competed quite quite often. I think as a as a junior up to the age of 20, I had uh, 62 competitions. You know, so which I think is important for uh, for uh, you know long term athlete development. For a weightlifter is that uh, you know part of the process is learning how to compete managing yeah. that stress and uh, and uh, getting in there as often as possible of course you don't peak for every competition but uh, it's a it's a good uh, valuable uh, learning learning curve over over years yeah it's probably good to get as much experience as you can with that while you're young before you end up being an adult and then not understanding how to manage competition right yeah so just uh you know started competing got lucky actually in 1974 at the age of 14 competed at my first nationals they used to have a b division uh that was like my first three years i competed in the b division and then uh then finally qualified uh for a in uh 19, 1977 which was in edmonton alberta so it's uh it's been uh you know it's been good uh, to get that experience early on i think it's important it's funny that you know so, some athletes i see nowadays they they uh i don't know if they're afraid to compete but you know back in my day uh you know if we had an opportunity to compete nationally or internationally you know we jumped all over it whether we we're ready or not it's uh it's a good experience for you uh down the road when you get to uh, a higher level where you could maybe potentially win medals for for your country yeah i've definitely run into a few athletes like that that i've trained with and that i've coached that have just been really hesitant to approach competition but i think it's good to get in as much as you can especially if you want to be a good weightlifter yeah unfortunately right now it's uh, it's tough to have <laughs> yeah. a competition you know are still kind of you know, giving some thought to whether we go ahead with Ogopogo. Uh, uh, if we do, maybe it'll be just a couple of weeks later in, in August. But uh, I think we could probably manage it. But, you know, I want to make sure that uh, uh, we uh, cover all the bases and uh, make sure that uh, nobody comes in and shuts down the event, especially when people are committing to, to come here to, to compete. Yeah, especially if people are coming, like, from Alberta or from Saskatchewan. Right. Yeah. A lot of interest from Alberta. So, uh, yep. Yeah. I know a lot of my athletes are itching to go. (laughs) Yeah. So hopefully I'll be able to make a decision this week and, uh, and then, uh, you know, basically, you know, we usually have eight warm up platforms. Uh, you know, maybe we look at, uh, having, uh, a couple more added, we've got room there. So yeah, we would have less spectators. Uh, of course, because uh, if we have a maximum number that we can have in the facility, then perhaps we can have eight or ten lifters per session. Each each lifter has a platform, their own equipment, and then we just have a cleaning team in between every uh, every session, uh, gets everything cleaned up. And then on the competition bar, we have somebody uh, dedicated to cleaning that bar in between every uh, attempt. Yeah. So, maybe, so it might work. Yeah, just instead of having four loaders, you can maybe have like, three loaders and a cleaner yeah like yeah that. yeah yeah and so he started competing pretty early got lots of competitions in and then uh what was kind of the pinnacle of your career well competing for canada then 1988 olympic games uh, yeah. uh came 10th out of 29 didn't have the greatest competition i got a little overtrained prior to the event still not too bad but you know had i uh 
uh, being able to retain my shape uh, right up to the event, then there's a good chance I could have placed anywhere between fourth and sixth. So oh, yeah, yeah, a little bit higher than tenth. What was yeah. the uh, which competition did you ever get your best total at? Best total would have been uh, leading up to the Olympic Games. We we were in Europe and we lifted at a meet in uh, in Greece. And uh, it was my one claim to fame beating a Bulgarian, which uh, <laughs> didn't happen too often. But I totaled uh, 352 and a half in the 90 kilo category. Oh, wow. And, uh, and came close to making uh, 162 and a half snatch. And, uh, and I cleaned 200.5 uh, to beat Yvonne Darcy's uh, clean and jerk record. But it took me about half a day to stand up with it and didn't have much <laughs> left over for the jerk. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, which Bulgarian was that that you beat there? Uh, I can't remember the name. I'd have to look up the results, but it wasn't uh, like a top uh, Bulgarian, but it was Bulgarian. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, beating any Bulgarian in that time is still a great achievement. Yeah. Because that was kind of the, the peak of their, their program. Yeah, for sure. So uh, did you move into coaching pretty soon after you were done competing, or did you take a little break there? Uh, I took little breaks here and there. Probably went into a little bit of coaching uh, near the end of, you know, my last international competition would have been Olympic trials in 1992. And uh, so I probably went into a little bit of coaching. We trained out of Douglas College in New Westminster. So there's a, there's a few younger athletes that I worked with. And then I, you know, got, uh, got married and, and uh, took uh, some breaks here and there and, but always came back and did a little administration uh, work for the association and, and uh, kind of been involved with the board for, for a number of years now. So uh, when did you start taking over for your dad then? Cause your dad used to be the head coach of the club. Is that right? Yeah, he was the head coach. Uh, I mean, he would uh, stop coaching many years ago. So I just kept the club going didn't really have a, you know, a dedicated facility after we, uh, we lost our space at Douglas College, but uh, still uh, had, had some good athletes that had home gyms and, and coached out of there. Uh, Parm Pangura and his wife, Sophia Sandu. Uh, and there's uh, two or three other athletes that were involved in the club. So that was good, uh, good uh, to work with athletes. That was probably... Uh, right around 2000 to, to 2003 uh, leading up to the world championships in, in Vancouver. Well, yeah, and you, you organized that uh, world championships too, didn't you? Well, it was uh, myself and uh, Mike Talent. Uh, uh, he came over from Bosnia and uh, I was talking with him one day and I said, I'd like to organize a world championships in, in Vancouver. And he said that was his dream too. So we just kind of got the ball rolling. 1999, we went to the World Championships in Athens, Greece, and uh, uh, presented our bid and got selected. And uh, and then 2003, uh, it was the second largest World Championships after the 99 Worlds, uh, with 505 lifters uh, from around the world. So yeah. big event. Don't know if I want to do that again. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that must have been a whole lot of work having 500 plus international lifters and taking care of all that. Yeah, it was uh, it was a big big event. I mean, I was more on the sport side, but uh, still, I I prefer to be uh, uh, in front of uh, of an event, either as a coach, athlete, or a uh, spectator. Uh, it's completely different when you're on the backside, organizing and and making sure you know, everything, you know, everything comes together. I mean, it usually does for weightlifting, but it's not always, uh, not always easy. And when it becomes a big event, uh, it becomes even a little more difficult. Yeah, definitely a little bit stressful when you're managing so many different people from so many different countries. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it can kind of mimic the stress of, you know, bringing an athlete to a high level competition like that, but bringing an athlete to competitions a little more I don't want to say familiar, but I guess familiar because you get used to training so often, right? As opposed to trying to organize a big event from behind the scenes. 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, any any event that you put on, it's uh, it's a lot of work unless you uh, unless you're able to uh, organize a really good team of uh, of volunteers that take on specific roles. Uh, I mean, World Championships, we had a we had a, a large team, but still, uh, you know, it uh, escalates in how much work you have to do on when you have an event like that. Yeah. So a little more on the coaching side of things. Can you talk to us a little bit about what your approach is for programming philosophy and long-term athlete development? Uh, well, you know, if it's a, if it's a young athlete coming into the sport or even, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter what age, but uh, my focus is on technique. Okay. And in that, in that uh, the athletes will uh, learn how to train as well. But, uh, you know, I want to make sure that they're moving correctly, uh, getting better over time. And uh, so you have to be careful that you're not, you know, programming uh, where you're, you're kind of stuck with, uh, with what they have to do in training. You know, you have to be a little more flexible. I don't like to, uh, I mean, I could... Uh, plan long term you know we might have a long term goal for an athlete but uh really want to i i believe in in small cycles and reevaluating uh you know again we want to make sure that they're doing the right amount of work and training uh you know getting to a uh, you know good average intensity and uh and then once you uh you know become pretty sound technical and uh and a little more experienced, then, then uh, you can program a little bit better for them. But you know, the key is that uh, you have a good relationship with your athlete. You know, you get feedback from them. You give them feedback, and uh, make sure that uh, they understand that uh, uh, from day to day. Say, for example, eighty-five percent may change. Right, your yeah. your eighty-five percent off your one rep max, but uh, you're not going to be at 100% every day in training. So you have to make sure that, uh, that uh, uh, you're not so committed to following that program uh, to failure that you make the right decisions. So if I'm not there as a coach, then the athlete has to decide, okay, it's a tough day. Uh, I'm going to back it up a little bit, but still do the work. And, and that's important. If you're failing all the time, then that's what you're preparing yourself to do is fail. So, as, you know, we want to be as, you know, have that positive experience in training and, uh, and then uh, hopefully you're, you're, you're ready for competition. You know, it doesn't always uh, pan out the way you want it to, but uh, when it does, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's great for uh, both the athlete and coach. Yeah. Yeah, I really like what you're saying about having uh, your 85% is going to change from day to day because that's kind of where it's important to have what the technique looks like, what the movement pattern looks like, kind of govern what the intensity should be to a certain degree. Right. And, you know, yeah, with athletes, you, you've got the athletes that are, you know, they're so committed to, to following the program that, they, that they, they will work the failure and uh, over and over again because they're, they're stubborn. They, they want to make those weights, but at the end of the day, you just have to back it up a little bit, get the work in. And, and then you've got the athletes that, uh, you know, might take the easy way out. Right. Yeah. Well, if you don't explain to them that, uh, you know, for example, maybe your working weights are, uh, are singles or, or doubles. If you don't explain to them that, uh, you know, in your warm up leading up to that, that you should be doing triples to warm up that technique and the body, then, uh, then some of those athletes will maybe do just singles or doubles all the way up. Right. So at the end of the day, they're not really getting a lot of work done. And, uh, you know, we want, uh, you know, it's that repetition, good quality repetition o over time. That's going to get you the result. Yeah. And I guess that's where it comes important to have that coach's eye on the athlete and, you know, as much as possible, because then you have those athletes that you're saying don't push themselves hard enough or those athletes that follow the program to failure. 
right? And it's important to have that coach's eye on there to kind of just bring them back to the middle. And oh. yeah, you you got to be able to you know see evaluate them and see okay, look at they're looking good today. Let's maybe push it a little bit harder, or you know they're not looking good. Let's back it up a little bit. And uh, you know I I've got a pretty good eye as far as technique goes, you know and. You know, sometimes you might struggle a lot of time as a coach figuring out, okay, why, you know, what's going on here? So you got to really take a close look and, and uh, figure things out and, and uh, hopefully get them moving the right way because you've got uh, some lifters that, uh, you know, we want to have contact, say, for example, in the snatch at the hips. But some athletes, they, they think of it as a, as a, a hard contact. You know, uh, you know, newer athletes that are that are learning that kind of have the basic technique, they may not even make any contact. You know, they come close. You know, so you want to l- teach them how to be able to get the right contact where they can generate the most power and speed of that bar, uh, so they can move under the bar much better. You know, so it's uh, you. Sometimes you gotta you gotta be kind of a you invent uh, an exercise or find an exercise that's going to get them to, to understand it better. And, uh, you know, so sometimes it, it works out well. Other times it's a, it's a bit of a struggle. The athlete gets a little bit frustrated, but, you know, it's just, uh, you just keep working away and hopefully uh, it all comes together. Yeah. It's always kind of a case by case basis when you have different athletes of different proportions, different backgrounds, some of them might learn quicker. Some of them might take a little bit more time. You can't always just say, okay, we're just going to do hang snatch until you figure it out. Sometimes you got to change it up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you've got, you, like you said, every athlete's different. You know, one athlete, you can tell them once and they, they get it. Uh, other athletes, you may have to teach them the same thing over and over again a number of times before they, they get it. Mm-hmm. You know, so, uh, so yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, back in my day, I trained a certain way, uh, it worked well for me and uh you know nowadays it uh you know it's uh it may not work well for for everybody you know i still have a you know certain uh thinking of how people should train but again i've got to find a way to get them to be better lifters so i've got to look at uh, adding in some exercises that perhaps i didn't do uh you know moving moving forward in the sport but it's something that will benefit them yeah yeah because you started training at a pretty young age but it's i think it's at least in my experience it's more rare to have people start weightlifting at that young age it's a little more common to get people that have already went through high school or they've kind of dabbled with crossfit in their early 20s and then they turn to weightlifting so they might need a like vastly different exercise selection that than say a 12 year old might need the proper right. movements yeah it's pretty basic uh you know with the real young uh kids coming into the club you know i just alternate uh back and forth we you know those be snatch uh, uh exercises one workout clean and jerk exercises the next and you know we just keep working on that technique you know get them get them to a certain level and now we can start to uh kind of give them some kind of programming uh that will move them uh you know maybe faster along yeah and then sometimes you get those athletes that have gone from crossfit and then they decide okay now i want to specialize in weightlifting but then they've ended up developing a few bad habits from crossfit and that makes the whole process of learning the proper technique that much harder because now instead of just starting from scratch you kind of got to rebuild over those bad habits yeah i mean it's uh it can be tough at times because of those those bad habits are ingrained and uh, you know what, again, it's just finding the right exercises to get them to feel, feel it better, you know? And what I always tell my athletes is that uh, I can tell you how, how I want you to lift. I can show you how I want you to lift. And you can think about it all you want, but if you're gonna, if you're gonna change technique that's ingrained in you over time, then you're going to have to kind of almost force yourself to uh, to make that change, 
Okay. It's, it, just thinking about it isn't going to help you. <laughs> Obviously, you know, that is important, but, but uh, if you continue to do it the same way, but think differently, then uh, you're going to get the same result. So yeah. you, 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 when it comes down to it, you know, basic technique is, is, is uh, great, but it's the refining uh, of that technique, uh, maybe specific to their body type, you know, uh, so you, you just kind of have to have to make little changes here and there and, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, they become better lifters. And you, yeah, you'll see a lot of kind of the same common errors, uh, say from athletes that come from CrossFit, you know, and, uh, and then you, uh, you, you get them to make those little changes and then all of a sudden now they, they're starting to feel uh, uh, more confident in their, in their lifting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to make it sound like I'm saying CrossFit always gives bad habits, but you know, sometimes it does, but overall, if someone might have those one or two little bad habits, if you can just fix those one or two small things, then it might be great because they might've already built that, yeah. that base of the movement. But now as long as they have that one little pattern tweaked up, now everything might be perfect. Right. And you know, like, you know, CrossFit, it's a great, it's a great sport. And uh, it's been great for us because uh, we get more people exposed to Olympic weightlifting. But, you know, they, there's really kind of, if you look at it, there's, there is two kind of techniques within CrossFit, say, for example, with the, if you just look at the snatch, if they're doing a number of reps, obviously uh, they can't approach it the same way as if they're doing a one rep max, okay? But if they're better technically, then maybe they become a little more efficient when they're doing a number of reps. Yeah. So, but it, they are very different, uh, you know, one rep max. And then, you know, say if you're doing 10 or 15 uh, reps at a lighter weight for, for time, then uh, obviously uh, you can't perform them both the same way. Yeah. The movement pattern is going to be a little bit different between each of them. But right. at the end of the day, that that technical efficiency is going to be most important rather than just ripping out reps for time with poor form. Well, for sure, because they're they're going to be they're going to uh, utilize their energy maybe a little bit better if they're just a little bit better uh, uh, technically. Yeah. So for those kind of beginner athletes that you're just introducing with technique and not a lot of load. Do you have any specific benchmarks that you want them to hit before you start loading them, like a certain age or a certain amount of work per week, or is that kind of just a judgment call that you have to make? It's it's a judgment call, you know. Like how you know with the younger ones, you know they can maybe test a little bit more, but I don't want my any of my athletes testing all the time, right? Because yeah. they're then they're not doing the work, you know. So, but with a young young uh, kid in the club. We just want to focus on, uh, okay, getting them to move better. And, you know, if they're having a good day, then maybe we, uh, we get them to try a, a personal record in, in training. Then, you know, then we can kind of gauge their training a little bit better. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really you got to make a, a good call for them. And we're not, like, overloading athletes, uh, no. hopefully. You know, maybe some coaches uh, do, but – you know, I, I want to make sure that uh, if they're doing a personal record that, uh, you know, it's fairly smooth. I don't want to uh, put the athlete in jeopardy. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you're having those, those personal records that end up being really ugly, you know, pressing out or whatever, then they end up basing their training off of lifts that don't look good. And then a lot of their training lifts aren't going to look good either. Right. We had, we had one coach, you know, he's a, he's a great guy for the sport, done a, done a lot over the years, helped out a lot of young kids. And he used to have a club competition where it was the first introduction of the sport to the parents. And he would, uh, he would allow them, instead of just having the typical uh, three attempts, that if they missed their third attempt, but they were close, then they could try again and they could try again. So that, you know, sometimes they would, you know, try two or three more times to, to do over a hundred percent and, and uh, just about kill themselves. And this is the first introduction to the parents. And I, and I said, you know what, uh, I think you've got to, if you're going to introduce it to the parents, you know, 
uh, you know, try to pick some good weights, make it look good, you know, make the parents confident that this is the right sport for their kids because there's a lot of misconceptions about the sport. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, those parents that have the, the misconceptions about the sport, uh, many times are putting their, uh, their kids into sports that are, are much harder on the body uh, than weightlifting would be if they're being taught properly by a good coach. Yeah, I've seen plenty of studies out there that look at sports and how many injuries there are per kid per hour. I was pretty sure that soccer was the number one injury sport, whereas weightlifting was pretty low on the list. Right. As long as you're training properly with you know manageable loads, it should be pretty hard to injure yourself in weightlifting. Yeah, and uh, you know we want to build up over time. There's no at, at a young age. There's no hurry. Uh, you know, maybe what if they, you know, show to be a very promising athlete young and, and there's potential to make uh, some teams, you know, maybe you push them a little bit harder. But again, you know, you want uh, them to be as successful and confident as possible in training. Yeah. And then even at that point, like severe acute injuries, like elbow dislocations or anything like that are also super rare. It's more so just kind of the smaller things like a nagging wrist or a little bit of tendonitis somewhere. Yeah. And again, you can just have to watch, uh, you know, how much work you have them doing in training, you know, like if, uh, if they're, you know, nine years old, then, then maybe they're doing two or three sessions a week for 45 minutes. You know? Yeah. If that over time they, they get more experience, then, you know, you can, uh, you can add some, some time or, uh, within their training. But, you know, like I've got a, a night, a really good young girl in the club that, uh, that manages well, pretty picked up the technique pretty quick and, uh, and all that, but we still focus on, on doing the work and, uh, and just the, the rare time when we might go for, for a personal record. Yeah. Cause I mean, the better the technique is too, again, the lower the chance of injury. And as long as you spend all that time in the beginning working on that good technique, then as long as that technique doesn't break down because you're overloading them or giving them too much work too fast, then in theory, it should be pretty safe. Yeah. I mean, they just, uh, you load them over time and, uh, and then they'll, they'll have, have success, but yeah, the better the technique, less stress on the body. Yeah. So do you find that uh, like the typical coach's programming looks a lot different now than it did when you were training as an athlete? How do you think that's kind of evolved over time? Uh, yeah, it looks uh, quite a bit different. You know, a lot of different exercises that I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have or never did do. But, you know, I've incorporated some of them in the, in the training and, and they've been good for, uh, you know, perhaps teaching uh, people to break bad habits. And, uh, uh, just, uh, uh, maybe there's a lot more accessory work in, in training nowadays, you know, where, you know, back in my day, it was old school. You just, uh, basically did the lifts and, 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 you know, train hard through, uh, through those, uh, those programs and, and, uh, you know, you get, get the results, you know, when I was on the national team we were training 25 hours a week, you know, so, uh, so you're doing a fair bit of volume and, uh, and over, over time you're conditioning your body to that volume. Yeah. So when you were training 25 hours a week, do you, uh, do you know how many like reps that would have been or how many sessions per week as opposed to just hours? Uh, the sessions we were doing were, uh, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we were training twice a day. And then Tuesday and Saturday once a day. Okay, but, so that would have been most of those trainings were in the morning. Yeah. So uh, five five uh, of the sessions would be at ten. Would start at ten in the morning, and then the days we train twice, we would get about uh, anywhere between two and a half and three hours break yep. in between, and then we're back in the gym. And you know, some days you would. Uh, front squat in the morning, back squat in the, in the, in the second workout, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, that probably explains why there was a little bit less uh, accessory work back when you were an athlete. If you're squatting twice a day, I don't think you can handle much more accessory work. 
No, it'd be it'd be tough. We did a little bit of stuff, you know, jumps and throws and uh, yeah, and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, wasn't wasn't a lot of time to do the extra work and probably not a lot of energy. But yeah. even when I was training that way, when I'd have a day off, I felt like I should be doing something. Yeah, it was very tough to just sit, sit idle and. Yeah, because I mean, if you can condition your body to be able to handle a front squat in the morning and a back squat in the afternoon, it's almost going to be unnecessary to do any extra accessory work after that, because that's going to be a lot of stimulus on the body, as opposed to doing just one front squat, maybe twice a week, and then you're going to add in some split squats and stuff, because if you can condition yourself to do that heavy squat multiple times a week, you're going to get a lot more benefit out of that, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so then moving on to our last topic here. How do you think uh, the provincial and national sport organizations could help Olympic weightlifting a little more? Because I know the national body for like Sport Canada, they're not a big fan of weightlifting having so few numbers, so we don't really receive any government funding. But do you think they could change some policies or do anything differently to kind of benefit Olympic weightlifting since we are kind of a single participant sport rather than a team sport. So we don't quite see the numbers that say soccer or basketball do that are these big team sports that are instituted in schools. Well, I mean, I, I make it pretty clear that I'm not a big sport, a big fan of sport Canada. You know, I think they failed us as a, as a, as an organization that uh, is uh, supposed to help sport. Uh, I, I, we do get very little funding. Uh, what the reasons are, uh, hard to say. Maybe we're being penalized for what other countries are doing in the sport. But uh, you know, we, you know, we have a lot of good athletes in Canada. We've had success uh, regardless of of the lack of funding, and uh, it does doesn't seem to materialize into uh, support. And uh, like I really have a big problem when probably like the the uh, lowest paid employee at Sport Canada probably makes more money than the funding that we get as a national sport organization. Yeah. So uh, if we look at, uh, uh, for example, uh, Christine Gerard, uh, her success in the sport, and uh, the unfortunate part of that is that uh, uh, she didn't move up into uh, into those positions, uh, metal positions, uh, until the retests that were done. So uh, she would have lost out a little bit uh, because of it. Uh, if she was gold medalist in, in 2012, you know, perhaps uh, uh, many things could have happened uh, for her because of that. But also uh, the sport uh, didn't uh, uh, get any extra funding uh, due to that success. And, uh, you know, Sport Canada, you know, could have gone back and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, said, you know, listen, she was the rightful gold medalist in 2012. Uh, you know, here's uh, some extra funding for the sport. You know, we have other athletes that are coming up. We've got uh, two that potentially could win win medals at the next Olympic Games if uh, if it does take place in 2021. Yeah. So uh, again, I think those athletes are are funded fairly well, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, we uh, uh, the sport itself uh, just doesn't get the support. And you know what? There's tons of people doing Olympic weightlifting in Canada. We just don't get the benefit of those numbers. If you look at all the people that are involved in CrossFit that do some form of Olympic weightlifting, uh, athletes in other sports that do uh, Olympic weightlifting to get better in their sport. So there's, there's many people doing Olympic weightlifting and a lot of times they are benefiting from our knowledge. Yeah. Our coaches, our athletes are working with, with them uh, hopefully, and uh, and teaching them to be to be better uh, at Olympic weightlifting. But at the end of the day, we don't get uh, the uh, acknowledgement of the value that we have within sport in Canada. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's kind of one of the things that goes along with uh, how other sports seem to have managed their system. Like, for example, if you play on a basketball team or a soccer team, I'm pretty sure everyone that plays on that is registered to their provincial sports organization. Whereas if you kind of look at, well, I'm not entirely sure how it's done in other provinces, but at least in Alberta, the only people that are actually registered as Alberta Weightlifting Association members are the people that compete. But there's still plenty of people, like you're saying, in CrossFit gyms or in sports performance gyms that use the Olympic weightlifting movements. So if all of those people that weren't just the people competing were also registered in the sporting body, then we'd have way more participants and then maybe Canada Sport would look at us and say, okay, maybe you do deserve this funding. But at the same time, it's kind of a chicken and egg conversation because all of us athletes are saying, well, if we had a little bit more funding, you know, we would perform better. But then Canada says, well, okay, well, how, why don't you perform better? And then we'll give you a little bit more funding. So we're kind of just stuck between a rock and a hard place of how do we get that funding? Yeah, but I think we, we do perform pretty well. If you look over the years, That's what we do. we've yeah. had the athletes that have won medals at junior worlds, senior worlds, Olympic games. You know, we uh, were, you know, there's some good clubs in, in Canada, like, I, I would say that the sports system in, in, in Canada is far behind the times. Uh, maybe there's a few good facilities out there. Yeah, but those aren't products of Canada sport. Those are products of like independent weightlifters trying to make the brand grow. Uh, well, you, you've got some facilities that are, you know, perhaps quite, quite good in Canada where maybe weightlifting can access them, but very few. Yeah. And uh, if you look at, uh, 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 for example, you know, probably one of the best clubs in Canada for weightlifting is, uh, is uh, Machine Rouge in, in uh, Quebec. And uh, they have a facility that's funded by the, by the uh, local uh, government, I, would, I, I, I guess you could say. And it's an old uh, a hockey arena that's been converted into a, a multi-sport training facility. So they, it houses weightlifting. Uh, gymnastics, judo, and boxing. And uh, so weightlifting has their own dedicated spot. I don't believe it costs them any money uh, to train out of that facility. I, uh, last year, I believe they had 17 athletes from that club qualify for nationals. Wow. And many, many of them are competing internationally. Yeah. A very strong club, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's not costing... Uh, uh, that coach money to uh, to operate a facility where you know for myself I've got to if I want to uh, have a facility you know it's a big cost because we have to rent the space you know and uh, so it can be kind of tough for many clubs to uh, to uh, uh, keep going uh, and if you uh, you know you look at uh, you know, I think even with uh, with people, administrators in sport in Canada, they think that uh, there's many facilities out there for us to train at because there's gyms everywhere. Okay? Yeah. But we can't access those gyms. We can, uh, They don't have the equipment. Two, they don't like anybody to use any chalk or drop weights. You know, so, yeah, there's lots of gyms out there, but we don't have the ability to utilize those facilities. And yeah. so they're, it's, a, it's a very tough uh, uh, position for a sport to be in and to grow. Yeah, that's kind of one of the things that you see pretty common is that people will just kind of associate Olympic weightlifting with just going to the gym, right? And it's not just a gym thing that people go to to look good, right? It's still a sport. But you, you also look at, uh, you know, if you try to, uh, say you take it soccer, for example, okay, huge amount of participation in Canada in, in soccer. Guess what? All kinds of soccer fields out there. Yeah. Right? And you don't have to necessarily pl play on a soccer field. You can play on any field, you know, and, you know, indoor soccer. There's, you know, there's many opportunities for soccer players to access but uh you know baseball you know like uh hockey there's all kinds of facilities right almost every community has a has an ice arena or or more so you know it's uh it, it is tough i mean 
I, you know, it would be great if, uh, if, if uh, the sports system in Canada uh, created more opportunity for shared facilities where, uh, you know, weightlifting could be in a, in a facility along with other sports where there's a benefit uh, uh, for those other sports to be uh, next door to us. Yeah, because then all those other sports could benefit from using weight training for their sport. Right. And then yes, if there was kind of a place like Machine Rouge in every province in Canada, just imagine how good we'd be performing on the international stage. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean if you, you know, the more people you get exposed to the sport, then the more opportunity you're going to have to develop uh, some great champions. And, uh, yeah. you know, so, you know, for, you know, even though we're considered a small sport, uh, we have some pretty good lifters uh, internationally. Yeah, because even if you look at just Bodhi Santavi, for example, like he's pushing the snatch world record right now, and he's just training out of his garage. Yeah, I think he's, what, five kilos behind the world record? Yeah, because he was hitting 180 three or four times in the last couple months. Right. And you look at, uh, like, Maud Saron, she's, uh, she's, I think she could be right in there for a medal at the Olympic Games. Yeah. But a few other athletes that uh, could place uh, fairly high, you know. So yeah, I think we've done pretty good for the minimal resources that we have. And yeah, you know what what I look for in Sport Canada and the Canadian Olympic Committee is to go to work for us, okay. And it's not just for the sport, but it's for the individuals involved in the sport. So if they if if they don't go to bat for an athlete and take an opportunity away from them, uh, then they've failed. Yeah, because right now it's kind of all the auxiliary people involved in the sport, like not necessarily the athletes, but all of the administrators and coaches like yourself that are kind of taking the hit where they're failing. Yeah. All right, Guy, thanks for coming on. Uh, where can people find you on social media and your website? Uh, well, we have, uh, we're on Instagram, so Vikings Weightlifting uh, Club. Uh, we have a, a website that kind of is partly my business, but also the club as well. So it's vikingweightlifting.com. And then we have a, a, a Facebook page, Vikings Weightlifting Club as well. So uh, lots of opportunity to find us. Uh, we're right in, uh, in Kelowna, BC. So uh, nice little spot, great facility. So if you're in town, come on by. Awesome. All right, guys. Thanks for being on. All right. Thanks for having me.